In this video I'll be finishing off some details on the main deck of the ship. There's not much to do in this video, it's really just the installation of a few of these platforms. These pieces are I1 and I2, along with a few little plastic pieces for detail. And then the majority of this video will be the installation of the hand railing on the main deck. I won't be working with very many parts in this video. There are only a handful of plastic pieces on this uh, sprue and these photo edge platforms. And a lot of hand railings, which I've already painted and prepared, so they are just ready to be stuck down. I'm going to start by painting these platforms. The railing will go in the light grey camouflage colour and the plating for the deck will go in the colour of the deck. Okay, I'll start with the so I'll start with the deck colour, which is XF54. Although photo etch is two-dimensional, it is obviously in reality a three-dimensional object. And even though it is very flat, you do need to spray it in multiple directions. Otherwise you will get a shadow where there isn't any paint applied. And then it will make it look a bit odd. In this video, I'm going to try something a little bit different. This is going to be a long form video. Not sure if this is going to work. I suspect there's going to be a lot of empty space while I am I'm working on something and not saying anything. But the intention is to create a video that shows you more of what I am doing, but is also something that's easier to edit and has a smaller package of work done in it. For the videos that I've been producing so far, I film around eight hours of video and then cut that down into something around 10 to 15 minutes. It takes quite a lot of time to cut the videos that extensively, showing only really the, the more interesting bits. So in this video I've tried to optimize things a bit more with my setup, actually making sure that what I'm filming can be seen better with some screen setup showing me what I'm actually trying to capture. And then I'm going to do this rather small bit of work, just installing the railings and try and talk through as I go along. Okay, the, that's ready for folding. I will now prepare the plastic pieces. I'll keep these on the sprue. Uh, I just need to clean up this piece and I can spray all of these in the light gray along with a few other of the photo edge pieces. I think I can just file it into the correct position. These now dried off photo edge pieces need to have the deck gratings masked out. To do this I'm using TMA masking tape. It is quite gentle on the paint. It's got a nice adhesive that won't leave marks. I have it in a variety of sizes. This is 5mm thick tape which I'm just going to use to cover these longer pieces. And I'm using tweezers to position the tape more effectively just to get that precisely on the line at the edge of the grating. It's just not thick enough, so I'm going to need two pieces. That's uh, not much of a problem, really. This is three millimeter thick tape. Your initial thought might be, yay, he's finally put on the last piece of masking tape, he can move on. Well, no, we are now halfway. Now, I will acknowledge that you don't need to be this pedantic about it. You could take a piece of card and block out a, you know, a section of the parts and then just be more careful with how you're spraying. But I do find that if you're painting even a part that's flat like this, 
it still is in reality in, in three dimensions. So you do have to come at it from quite a few angles. And if you're doing that, then you do have to be really careful with the airbrush not to overrun something. And well, I'm not that careful. So I tend to prefer to prepare everything as much as I can before I start to paint or do something. Just get everything lined up and then have a easier time of assembly or painting or whatever task it is at the moment. A lot of simple steps that are hard to get wrong or that at least if you do get wrong can be easily reversed to me is preferable to taking an action that is quick but if it goes wrong could result in a bit more effort to correct. But now these parts are masked and that the parts on the plastic sprue are also prepared, I can now spray everything in the light gray. Same process as before, just gonna use a few drops of this paint, there's not much to do. So I'll just use a stick to take out what I need. This is quite an inefficient process because spraying a lot of area and well, in that area, it's only the railing that you really want to hit, which is not all that bulky. So for the most part, you just spraying paint straight through the part. Once I've built up a few layers on this, I'll just set it aside and let it dry and then move on to working on the plastic pieces. Plastic pieces are already in a gray that's very similar to the color of the paint. So I think uh, just a light coating will be sufficient. Now to paint the life rings, these just need to be in red. They're very small and it's not something that you can reasonably mask off or in my skill level at least, paint with an airbrush. So I'll just use a little bit of paint on a fine brush. Now this isn't gonna be perfect. There'll probably be some paint that doesn't quite go down to the plate that the ring is attached to or maybe some of the paint will overrun a bit, go into the center, or onto the side, but it actually doesn't matter because while you will notice it when it's clean like this, once you apply panel line to it, those kind of defects get hidden underneath the panel line. While the little laugh rings are drying, I'll then work on these photo etch parts. First up, I'll remove the tape and then I'll remove the parts from the sprue. Once that's completed, I can then fold them up into their final shape and glue them together. For the thin super glue, I make a little trough with some masking tape and an old ring from a roll of masking tape. The thin super glue will sit in here quite nicely and dries very slowly on its own in a little trough like this. Just a few drops will be sufficient. And I'll take my piece of wire and a pin vise as the applicator. Before folding these parts, I'm just going to inspect them to see if there's a upside or a detailed side and a non-detailed side. I did see that this piece has a little bit of a burr on the edge. If that isn't addressed, it's not gonna sit flat on the ship. So I'm just gonna take a fine file and remove that burr. And then after just checking for symmetry and if there's an upside and a downside and, and so on on these parts, well, I determined that they are basically mirror images of each other and that there's no up or down. So I just placed them on my photo edge fold, folding tool so that I could get a good fold on them. For a part like this where you have a long, delicate fold, a photo edge folding tool is really useful because you wanna be able to fold the full length of the piece in one go, instead of having tweezers and just having to fold half and then move down, then fold the other half. The part that I'm mostly using this tool is this long straight edge. I haven't really used the bending parts, but just getting that long straight edge is so useful. Since this railing has been scored, it bends very easily on the edge. That is convenient because it, it helps you with folding the piece. But unfortunately, as you can see in this place, it also makes it a little more delicate and it makes it into a place where breaks can easily occur. 
So you do have to be quite careful with these pieces. If you mishandle them even slightly, they can snap. But it is possible to glue even little bits of railing back together. You might have noticed earlier on, on that photo etch sprue, there is a piece of railing that is fairly badly damaged. Fortunately, that is how it came, but um, I think I'll be able to recover it. Now I'm applying the extra thin super glue. You do not need a lot of it. And on a part like this, the trick is to not let it overrun into the part and then block those little holes on the grating. Fortunately, capillary action will draw the glue mostly to where it needs to go. So as long as you don't overdo it in one go, it should work out. I do find that after using the wire and picking up glue a number of times, it does build up on the wire itself. The glue dries on the actual wire. And then when that happens, you start to pick up more and more glue. If you do that too much, then you do get large blobs of glue on the end of that thing. And it does go all over the place and make a mess. So I have a little glass jar with some acetone in it, which I dip the, the wire in to dissolve the super glue, just to make sure that I don't get a excess buildup. For these little platforms that go next to the 155 millimeter guns, it's the same process, just fold it, it folds very easily, and then get a little bit of glue on this piece of wire to secure it in place. These parts do have a upside. So in this case, there's more detail on the face that you are looking at now than on the, at least the, the railing portion of it. Obviously you want that to be facing outwards so that the viewer can see it. There's no point in having that detail facing inwards. On the inward side, it's very plain. It's just obviously the, the flat back with no detail on it. Just the holes going straight through. These four pieces are otherwise identical and they are symmetrical. So you can place them on any location, any of the four locations. The only consideration that you have to keep in mind is just making sure that that detailed side faces outwards. I did realize that holding it in my fingers with a small piece like this was a bad idea. And as you saw, I just managed to stick myself to the part. So for the other three, I moved on to using some tweezers. The tweezers easily grip it and make it significantly more easier to glue these parts together without gluing myself to the part. Now that all the parts have been folded and painted, the next thing I'm going to do is apply a varnish. This is an acrylic varnish. This serves two purposes, is to protect the underlying paint so that when you handle it, you don't break it off. It also provides a nice smooth surface for the panel line to run on. This will make it easier to get a nice effect with the panel line and also make it such that you can easily remove it without damaging the underlying paint. While I'm talking about varnish, I thought I'd give another quick demonstration. The purpose for varnish is not simply to protect the underlying paint from turpentine during the weathering process. Varnishes are also a lot harder than normal paint, which means they create a good protective surface against things like scratches. So for example, on this piece of photo etch, in the center here you can see it's got a glossy sheen to it. That's some paint covered in a layer of the same Timia X22 gloss clear coat. Then in other areas where it's more matte, you can see that there isn't any uh, protective coating on it. So if I just take a toothpick and work somewhere, you can see in the areas where there is no gloss coat, no varnish, it's very easy to scratch off that paint. But if I come to this location over here and try and do the same thing, I broke the toothpick there, I haven't been able to damage it. It is incredibly tough. Let's try with these tweezers. It has to really dig in to, to do damage. And you can see how much is actually even scratching the underlying photo etch, the metal. This shows you how much force you need to actually really do damage to this uh, paint when it's covered with a, with a varnish. So that's another reason to cover your paint with a varnish. 
just to protect the underlying things because well, you could accidentally scratch off some of the unprotected paint, it's unlikely that you're going to accidentally scratch off some of the paint covered with a varnish. So after that demonstration, I now apply the panel line. This is to me a black panel line. I use it all over the place. It's just good as a grime effect, so to speak. You can apply it everywhere and then just remove it with turpentine. It makes everything look a little bit more realistic. Application is very easy. Slap it on and let it dry for 10 minutes and then remove it with turpentine. As long as you are applying this to an acrylic paint, this process is safe. If you are applying the panel line on top of an enamel paint, it will be removed with the turpentine. So just, just make sure that you get the right type of paint on top. It's also going to be compatible with your lacquers. So lacquer or acrylic varnish is safe. The parts have now dried for around 10 minutes, so I'll prepare some mineral turpentine or white spirits, whatever you call it in your region of the world. And then I have my horrible old turpentine paintbrush that I use to remove the excess panel line. Since I prefer a very lightly weathered model, I will remove the majority of the panel line, even still there will be a, a bit of an effect from it. Once you've put the panel line on, you're never gonna get it all off. There's always gonna be just a little bit lying around, but you can get it to be remarkably clean. I just want to have a little bit to show off the details and to make it look like it is a bit more real. One other thing to just be aware of when it comes to mineral turpentine is that although it will not dissolve the plastic on the kit, it will dissolve plastic cement. So if you have glued parts together, and if you haven't protected those glue seams with an acrylic varnish, if you do go fairly heavy on the turpentine, there's a chance that you will dissolve that bond and the pot will break apart. But that's not such a train smash because you, you can just glue it back together again. I've typically only seen that happen on small pieces where there's only a tiny joint. On larger pieces, it tends to hold up a bit better. But just do be aware of that. If you are going heavy on the turpentine, just consider that the part may become unbonded. We'll also say that a little goes a long way. You don't need to drench the part in turpentine. If you look at the life ring now, you can see how with the panel line, the little defects around the edges have been cleaned up very nicely. In that sense, panel line is very forgiving. It hides the mistakes that you've made. Now that I'm ready to glue down all these pieces, the most important thing to do is to make sure that I position everything in the correct place. The manual tells us where to place these platforms that jut out from the side of the ship. And it gives us an indication of where some of the handwriting should go. But the rest of it is not very clear. What I have been able to find out is the section from here to here should be the three rung handrail and it should be a three rung handrail for the aft section of the ship and then everywhere else it's a two rung handrail. The other thing that needs to be taken into consideration are these other little bits and pieces that jut out from the side of the ship because there's going to have to be breaks in the railings at these places and also with the transition between the high three rung railing and the lower two rung railing and these platforms. So what I need to do is cut out all the pieces now, position them on the ship without any glue, make sure everything lines up and everything's going to be in the correct place, and then start sticking things down. So I'll start with the bits that have specified positions. I'll start with L27. This piece goes at the very front of the ship. It has a curve that is matched to the bow. There are two pieces. I'm not worried about the orientation at the moment, just that they fit reasonably in the space allocated. The next is a longer piece of curved section. Once again, there are just two of them. And this goes immediately after the anchor. These pieces have a section where this tube will fit through. That is 
going to help with determining the orientation. But once again, I'm not overly concerned with its position at the moment. Those are the easy pieces. Now a little bit of thought needs to be put into these long straight sections. Starting off with a two rung rail section. I call it two rung because I'm not counting the bottom rung because it's stuck to the deck and you don't really see it. So there's, there's really only two visible rungs on this railing. This piece needs to run from that second set of curved railings all the way to the wave break. Because of that, I do need to at least reasonably position that curved section of railing and then use that to determine the appropriate length to which I must cut this piece of straight railing. That seems to be about right. So I'll just copy that and then place those pieces on the deck. This is the first of the little platforms. I want to try and position the platform first so that it's centered on the barbette for this turret. I think it's more important that the platform be properly centered so that it looks correct when viewed from above than it is to get the railing cut perfectly onto a segment. What I'm trying to do here is use the railing itself as a guide to determine the placement of the platform. And what I can see when I hold the platform up to the ship with the railing on it is that it's centered around a post. So the, the entire thing is roughly three segments long. And what I can see is there's a post that lines up with the center of the barbette and also the center of the platform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it around that post and then use this piece to guide where I must actually glue down the platform at a later stage. For now I won't cut it perfectly, I'll just uh, leave it with a little bit of an excess. And once again I'll make a copy of that for the other side. I like to allocate out all of the parts at this stage, so I'll place the second platform near the other turret, just to make sure that I have all the parts that I need when I start to glue things down. After this platform, the railing transitions into a three rung section. So I now need to remove a three rung section of straight railing. This section of railing runs into the larger platform that sits in front of the 90 millimeter guns. I'm going to use the same method as before. I'm going to place the section of railing on the deck and use that as a guide to determine the correct placement of this platform. In this case, the platform appears to align quite nicely with the posts and that means I can once again cut it on a post and then use that to correctly locate the part on the ship. So I'm just going to use the tweezers to grab the piece of photo etch on the post that I want to cut and then make the cut, hopefully on the correct side of the post. This model is quite generous with the railing. There's quite a lot of excess. You can make a mistake and then cut a new piece of railing without having to worry about running out unless you're doing that an awful lot. So then I made another copy of this piece and placed that piece and its corresponding platform on the starboard side of the ship. After this longer platform, there is yet more three rung railing and it runs until just aft of the final 90 millimeter turret. Once again, I pick up the parts on the post that I want to cut off. And after a test fit, confirming it's the correct length, I then make a copy of it for the starboard side of the ship and put them in place. And I need to transition down into a two rung section. This runs all the way until the platform that goes in front of the aft 155 millimeter turret. Once again, I'm using the railing on the deck as the guide to locate the part while trying to center the platform on the turret itself. This location is remarkably similar to the one at the front. Looks like there's a central post which everything is lined up on. So I'll once again use that as the guide and 
cut out a piece that corresponds to that location. I pick up the piece of photo etch at the point where I want to make the cut and make a copy for the other side. It was at this point that I realized that that horrible piece of broken photo etch railing was for this aft section of the ship. It's one of these parts that isn't referenced in the manual, but when you look at the shape of it and where the folds are, it became quite apparent that this is where it actually belonged. Sometimes there are errors in the documentation and it doesn't tell you to install a specific part. And sometimes a piece of photo etch or sprue or whatever it is, comes with parts for multiple ships and you don't necessarily use all of them. So it didn't initially strike me as odd that it wasn't something that I needed to use. But then obviously when I got to this point and I was thinking about how I'm going to finish off the aft railing on this main deck, that I realized there was a section of railing missing that I needed to fill in. So I took the time to just quickly cut off and fold that piece, although it has not yet been painted. Just to give me an idea of how everything should be located. And then once I had positioned that, I could see what I wanted to do with this aft section of railing. And I proceeded to then measure and cut another section to the correct length and then make a copy for the other side of the ship. After positioning those last pieces, I then did just quickly spray and touch up the piece of railing for the aft of the main deck. I did damage it a bit further. It was very weak and it snapped in half, but I'm not too worried about that. I can reconstitute that at some other point. Looking at the superstructure, I noticed that there's a small section of two rung railing that should be installed between the aft turret and this little step in the superstructure. So I also then cut out a few pieces to, to fill that gap. It's minor detail, but it should have some railing. It's just not mentioned in the model's instructions. Moving on to the aft section, this is once again three rung railing. Here there are a number of obstacles in the way. Primarily this track for the catapult. But apart from that, it's a straightforward piece to align. These are fairly long pieces. I'm not able to cut out two sections from a single piece from the sprue. So I'll need to use two pieces and then I'll use the offcuts elsewhere. They are just over half the length of a single piece of railing on the sprue. So there's that piece and it's copy for the other side. And now it's just the very aft of the ship. Three more pieces to go. A little section between these structures on the side of the ship. I don't know what they are and the depth charges. And then a single piece that goes between the two depth charges, which is conveniently the same as one segment of this railing. With that, all the railing is cut to length and is in the correct place. However, there are a few plastic details that need to be installed first. First up, I need to install the last of this mooring equipment. In this case, I'm just using super glue because I wanted to bond quickly so that I can move on to actually sticking down the hand railing. This is not difficult work to do just sits on the very edge of the hull. I'm just being sure to orient them in the correct direction. There are only four of these parts that need to be installed, two on the port side and two on the starboard side. It was at this point that I noticed that I made two extra parts that I actually required. So that will just go into my little box of bits and pieces from various models over the years. And, and maybe one day it will be used for something on a ship that I'm building that's missing a part or needs something corrected or who knows what. And that's a good tip. Never throw away any of your spare parts or unused parts from a kit. Keep them because you could just find that you need them elsewhere. And while I'm working with these plastic parts and super glue, I figured I should also install these life rings onto these longer platforms. They go in the center and I think it would be a little bit easier to do it while they are loose so that I can hold them in a more convenient angle. 
extra thick super glue is a bit more slow drying so it gives you a little bit more time to reposition things often the first contact isn't in the correct position or at least for me that's the case so i like to have a bit of a slower drying glue so that i have time to get the positioning correct and now it's time to begin sticking down the railing i'm going to start with these easy sections at the aft of the ship start from the center and then work outwards so that i don't have to try and lean over delicate photo etch First, I'll position these little sections on the superstructure. To start any section of railing, I will use thick super glue, which I'll apply to the railing with a toothpick. For a short railing like this, this is all that's required. Put it down the full length of it and then just stick it in place. For longer railings or railings that have curves, I will then start with a shorter section, roughly the same length as these pieces in their entirety, and apply thick super glue to that and then tack that section in place and then position it with tweezers and fingers and whatnot and then use extra thin super glue for the majority of the length of it. So after installing that simple bit of photo etch and then moved on to installing this more complex section at the aft of the ship. Once again doing it first because once I'm putting the railing on the perimeter of the ship it will be more difficult to reach and work with these parts without causing damage. Now you can see the technique of gluing down one end first with extra thick super glue and then positioning it and then coming in with extra thin super glue to glue the rest of it in place. This is just a technique to give me time to make sure that the part is correctly positioned. This is a particularly ugly piece of photo etch. Not only is it broken but it also feels like it's just not quite the right shape. So this is going to require quite a lot of manhandling to get it into an acceptable position. Sometimes it happens, sometimes you just have to fight it. But you can usually come up with a solution that's adequate. I also have off to the left there some super glue accelerator. Sometimes the glue just isn't drying as fast as I would like, especially after it's been sitting out on the card for a while, it does become a bit stale and then dries more slowly. In cases like that, I will then use the accelerator just to insta-bond it. And here you can see the, the biggest problem that I had with this railing after it snapped, is that this joint, uh, it just doesn't quite reach. So, yeah, there we go. It, it, it just gets there, but it's tight. Anyways, I'll, I'll just carry on working it and see if I can get it to fit. I'll just move that bend on that last piece a little bit further down. And it seems to be a bit better now. But it is awfully awkward. Sometimes it feels like you need three hands to do this properly. So the position that there, it looks, looks about right. But I want to just get this stuck quickly. So, so I'll apply some accelerator and that should just about do it. Yeah, okay, well that was messy, but got it done. And I can now move on to the pieces on the sides of the ship. Before these parts can be stuck down, gaps need to be cut in these railing sections so that the fixtures on the deck can be accommodated. And of course, this needs to be placed in locations that align with the overall placement on the, of the part within the ship. I do this as I go along. I cut the part and then I glue it down because as the piece curves and depending on how it actually gets stuck down it could cause it to shift slightly on the deck causing parts to not quite align so instead of cutting them all at the very beginning i do it as i go along just to be safe now this piece has a slight curve on it so first up i'm going to tack it on and then bend it on the ship for very slight curves like this i prefer to not pre-bend it because it's very easy to then overdo it and then damage the part. And uh, using this method with extra thin super glue is uh, quite easy actually. 
it does require a bit of coordination because you do need to use both your right and left hand and be fairly dexterous. I by far prefer to use my right hand to apply the subagu and left hand to hold the part but such is not always possible. Once the part is initially tacked then use a little bit more glue and run it down the length of the part just to make sure it is well bonded. Once it is properly stuck down the part will stiffen out quite, in, quite a lot and uh, should become quite strong actually. A properly glued down rating should not be accidentally knocked off. In that sense, it actually can be fairly bad because if you do hit one of these pieces, once they are properly glued down, they will bend and buckle and it'll be a bit of an effort to straighten them out again. So you do have to be careful once you've glued these parts down. This piece at the bow does require a bit of bending because there's not a lot of structure that is actually in contact with the deck. So I do need it to, on its own, sit in the correct place. So I'm just going to handle it a bit to get it to where I want it. And then I can use some more glue to hold it in place. And that's the first piece of rating done of many sections. Next up is the other piece of curved railing. This is a fairly long section with an orientation that needs to be correct. Obviously the curve needs to fit the deck and then the gap needs to go in the correct place for that tube that sticks out of the side. And then that piece also impacts the location of this other piece that goes next to it on the flat section of the deck. So I kind of have to plan these two out together to make sure that I have it in the correct location. The aft of the straight section of railing also needs to be cut with a slight rake to it so that it conforms to the wave break. So what I'm trying to do here is position the tube so it's roughly centered in that box that it's sticking through. And then based on that, position this section of railing that's aft of it. And then what I'm actually going to do is cut this piece first because there's a little bit more leeway on this long rake piece because it runs up to the anchor and there's a gap there where it can actually move a little bit. It, you know, it can be a few millimeters shifted in another direction without looking strange. I think it's more important to get the section of rating behind it correct such that everything will then be connected smoothly and look like a seamless piece of railing. This does require a little bit of back and forth. There are some deck fixtures that are in the way and the railings need to be cut to conform to that rake, but uh, this is really a small piece of railing than a fairly straight and quiet section of deck, so it's not too difficult to get right. Once cut to my satisfaction, I apply the super glue to one end and tack it down, and then much in the same way as with the previous part, then work it into the correct location with tweezers, and then use extra thin super glue to glue it in place. When working with extra thin super glue, you do need to make sure that the parts that you are trying to stick together are in proper contact. If they're not properly touching, the glue won't work because the glue isn't thick enough to fill a gap. It does mean that with long pieces like this, you do have to press it down at multiple points to ensure that it has good contact. And of course, you then also need enough glue on the wire to be able to transfer it onto the part. If you do pick up too much glue and it overruns onto the paint, don't worry about it. Just let it dry. It'll have a very glossy effect. Once you're done gluing everything down, you can come back with some that varnish and spray it over those overruns and it will conceal the super glue. With that section of railing stuck down, I can now stick down this forward curved section. It must butt up directly against this aft piece of railing that I installed and because the forward part of it is not really terminating on anything significant it can float a bit and as I said it can be off by a millimeter or two. This is a particularly tedious piece of work. Although there is not a lot being done in this video it took hours to install all of this railing. Cutting out all these little gaps, gluing everything down, all the preparation work takes a huge amount of time. And that's why I'm running through this all sped up. Because 
at least the way I work, with lots of test fitting and making sure everything is in the correct location before gluing something down, it does mean that this kind of work takes a long time. But I think taking your time, doing it slowly, making sure it's correct before you glue it down is the way to do it. If you rush it, you're going to make mistakes and then you're going to spend a huge amount of time correcting parts, repainting parts because they've been damaged too badly, removing super glue and acetone and whatnot. It's just not worth rushing. You can cause real damage to the model if you do it that way. Once this railing is properly stuck down, it is fairly difficult to remove without damaging it. You have to get a knife underneath it, but even a knife isn't thin enough. It will cause a curve to be imparted onto the railing and will get all bent out of shape and not look very attractive afterwards. And then it's a whole mission to correct that so that it's smooth again. So yes, this is an incredibly tedious process. Fitting each piece, cutting out the railings in the correct location, cutting out sections for the parts of the deck in the correct location, doing it all one at a time and test fitting after each cut is extremely time consuming, but it's kind of what you need to do. And I don't really see a way around it. I will point out that when you move on to the other side of the ship, it is a bit faster because you already established all the cut points. And because the ship is hopefully symmetrical, then uh, all the cuts should be in the exact same place. And you, in effect, are using the railings on the other side of the ship as a guide to position parts and uh, to position the railings on the ship. Because you do want the railings across the ship to be aligned. You don't really want the railings on one side of the ship to be out of alignment with the railings on the other side of the ship because then that will you know, look a bit strange because the ship won't be symmetrical anymore. At this point I'm really just going to be giving you a nice long montage of railing being installed, sped up, and I hope you at least find this to be enjoyable to watch. This is one of the aspects of this long form video that I am not sure about. Do people actually want to see me spending hours, or at least hours sped up, installing railings on a ship? I guess I will find out. While the video is playing in the background, I'll just cover a few topics that have come up in the comments. A number of people have asked if I'm going to build anything other than a battleship. And the answer to that is, for the foreseeable future, it is unlikely. I build battleships for a number of reasons. Primarily I build them because I think they're fascinating vehicles or, or weapons. And uh, the, the reason why I am putting them on YouTube is primarily because, well, at this point, you don't see a lot of them. And I think these videos that I'm making kind of demonstrates why that is the case. Battleship models, especially 1 and 350 scale battleship models, are just a lot. A lot of everything. A lot of small pieces that require a lot of tedious work to apply. It's not necessarily something that translates to video very well. As I said previously, there's roughly 8 to 10 hours of work in one of these videos. That's building the ship, not creating the video, just the amount of time that I spent working on the model. And for this video, essentially all you're really seeing is the installation of some railing. So if you're trying to make a YouTube channel with lots of progress and action in each video, battleships at this scale are definitely not the way to go. So what you tend to see on YouTube are smaller ships, or at least battleships in a smaller scale, 1 in 700 seems to be quite common. A 1 in 700 scale battleship is comparable in size to a 1 in 350 scale destroyer. So they are significantly smaller and therefore significantly quicker to build because they'll have fewer parts because of the lower detail. But for these 1 in 350 scale ships, which is the largest common size of models, I think. You, know, you do get 1 in 200 and 1 in 100, but there aren't very many kits in those scales. So you won't be able to have a wide variety of models in that size. So 1 in 350 scale being the largest scale of widely available ships 
because most of the time, people that are putting videos of their models on YouTube are either building small ships or aircraft and cars and such things. I think uh, to an extent, these battleships are a niche that I'm trying to fill. It is, in a sense, what this channel is dedicated to, the construction of one and 350 scale battleships. And that probably won't change in the near future, although it could get to the point that I run out of classes of battleships to build and then I do need to make a decision as to whether or not I move on to a different class or if I start building other ships in a class of battleships that I already have. Although I've never built a cruiser or a aircraft carrier or something like that, I have a strong suspicion and I think good reason to believe that those kits are significantly easier to build than battleships. Battleships are large with incredibly complicated superstructure and a very large number of guns. If you're going to look at aircraft carriers, well, they are comparable in size or perhaps in some cases a little bit larger, but their superstructure is just really an island that's considerably simpler. And the majority of the deck is flat because obviously aircraft need to land somewhere. So based on that, I would think that a carrier, while comparable in size to a battleship, is significantly easier and quicker to build than a battleship. And that would at least explain why you see more carriers also, I think that more people are generally interested in aircraft carriers as the current capital ships compared to battleships, which were the capital ships of the past. But in any case, uh, it's the good old battleship that is not very well represented because of, as I say, I think the time consuming nature of the build of the ship and that not translating well to YouTube because you do need to put in a huge amount of work to produce a single video and that video might then only be on something very basic like installing railing around the entire perimeter of a ship. So I do understand that this channel, so long as I'm making videos, will probably be for a fairly niche group of people that are either incredibly interested in battleships or have some desire to look at the techniques that I'm using to build it. So that is why I'm trying to make these videos in more of a tutorial fashion where I'm explaining what I'm doing and showing the techniques that I use. I'm not saying that these are the best techniques or the only techniques. It's just how I've figured out how to build these ships over the years that I've been doing it. And the intention is that for somebody who does want to take on one of these larger and more complicated types of models, they can get a bit of a reference to see how they can go about actually constructing it. The primary realization that anybody comes to when building these ships is that it is going to take a long time and they must just accept that, take it slow, do a little bit every now and then and eventually after a year or two you will have a finished ship. And because not very many people seem to have the desire or time to build one of these things, they'll have something on their display cabinet that is quite uncommon to see. The only places that I've seen as many battleships as I have is in museums. And it's also not uncommon for me to <laughs> go to a museum and look at their models and think, well, mine are better. So I do quite enjoy looking at my little collection of 1 and 350 scale battleships. Moving on to a little bit of a channel update. I have been traveling quite a bit over the past few months. So all the videos I had prepared in advance have been eaten up. Essentially, I haven't really been working on the ship much or creating videos for around six weeks, which means as of the creation of this video, you are current with the build progress and I have no videos scheduled for release. The consequence of that is that there may be in the upcoming weeks, some weeks or some fortnightly releases that are missed. Maybe they'll be delayed by a week or two. And that's simply because I need time to work on the ship and then create the videos. 
the next video will not be as long as this one, or at least I don't think it will be. I'm going to be working on those four little guns that goes on these wings that stick out in the middle of the ship. I'll be constructing just those four guns and installing them. I'll be once again using this long format, but because it is on a significantly smaller package of work, the video itself should not be as long as this one. The length of this video really comes down to the nature of railing. I don't think it would make sense to do multiple videos on installing railing. For example, I think it would be a bit odd to show, for example, installing railing on the port side of the ship and then installing railing on the starboard side of the ship or aft and forward or whatever combination you want. I think it would also have been a bit odd to show all the preparation for installing the railing and then not actually installing the railing and having them in two separate videos. So going forward, I do expect that this will be one of the longer videos that I'll create. I wouldn't want to go much over an hour. I think I'm going to try and stick to around half an hour as the average video length. However, I do think that the next video is going to be quite a bit shorter than half an hour since it's only going to be the construction of four guns. There's not a lot that needs to go into that. And that should give me an opportunity to get back ahead of the schedule and create more videos so that I can stick to a regular release schedule. There will now be a short break in the narration while I complete the installation of the railing on the port side of the ship. When the countdown in the top right hand corner of the screen reaches zero, the narration will resume. With the installation of this little segment of railing at the stern of the ship, the railing is fully completed on the port side of the ship, and that then marks the halfway mark. Now I'm not going to do another time lapse of the installation on the starboard side of the ship because this video is already very long. So I'll give it the 10 minute video treatment and do a rapid fire installation of all the railing from the stern to the bow of the ship on the starboard side. This gives you a fairly good illustration of how it compared to a 10 minute video. On the port side of the ship, you saw the installation at four times speed with the boring parts of me preparing things and correcting things and doing other little bits and pieces cut out. So, so not only is it four times faster, but you're not actually seeing absolutely everything that I've done. By comparing the video to the starboard installation of the railing to the port installation of the railing, you can see just how much I was cutting out in the 10 minute videos. There were two main reasons why I was cutting out that much footage. The first is actually that I had a poor setup for recording and a lot of what I was doing was out of focus or out of frame. So that's something that I've worked on to correct for this video just to make sure that what I am doing is properly captured. So there was that limiting factor. I could only show you what was in frame and what was in focus. And then the other aspect was that I didn't want it to be a video with lots of blank space and waiting because I thought that would be boring to the viewer. So this is going to at least see what happens on that front. If this video gets a positive response, then I'll make more in this longer format. If it gets a negative response, then I'll go back to my rapid fire version and uh, just show little clips of here and there. And now after reaching the bow, we finally conclude this long process of installing the railing. This then moves us onto the last stage of the video, which is to mat down all this glossy superglue with some matte varnish. 
The varnish that I'm using is Mr. Kylo 182, thinned with Mr. Rapid Thinner. This is very potent matte varnish. A little bit goes a long way, and I find it incredibly easy to overdo it and create a somewhat white frosted effect on parts, which is actually very easy to correct. It just, uh, at first, is quite shocking. And uh, just, just be aware that you don't need to panic about that if you do get it on too thick you can easily get that frosting to disappear. You do need to be considering your air pressure quite carefully. If you have too much air pressure, it will mist and fog, and that will assist with creating that frosting effect. So you wanna basically, as always, spray with the minimum air pressure to get the paint to leave the gun. And of course, you need to make sure that the paint itself is properly thinned. This varnish is very thick out of the bottle, so I do quite extensively thin it to get it to a milky consistency. All that I'm doing here is focusing on the part where I installed the photo etch. So I'm just running the airbrush along that seam and putting a little bit of matte varnish onto it. It immediately mattes it up. It's quite a fantastic effect. This is very nice matte varnish. I find it works quite well in the sense that it does make things very matte very easily. It's just that frosting that you have to be careful of. So how do you correct the frosting? Well, this is what you do. You just get your Mr. Rapid Thinner, you load it direct up into the airbrush, and you go wild. Well, not too wild. You want to spray it on all surfaces where there's frosting, just to wet it. You don't want it to get to the point where it's forming drops and running. You just want to moisten it all up. That will then allow the matte varnish to rehydrate and move a little bit, and that white frosting effect will disappear. And once that's happened, this matte effect looks well as good as I've seen on any kind of varnish. So if you are going to do this, just be careful. You will be loosening the paint and the paint underneath it because it is all going to be soluble with this uh, thinner. So if you are going to do this, just be careful. Don't overdo it. Do it bit by bit to figure out what is actually required to remove that frosting effect and no further. If you are going to apply it with a paintbrush, be extremely careful. This is going to loosen the paint underneath the matte varnish as well, which is actually quite a thin layer. So you could lift up your paint underneath and then you'll have a real mess that you need to fix. So where possible, just spray it on and spray it on fairly lightly. It will then rehydrate and remove that frosting quite nicely. I'm just giving the whole ship a once over in case there were any little bits and pieces that I missed from previous rounds. I have subsequently noticed that there are some more sets of railing on the superstructure that I need to put some matte varnish on. So I have to come back and do those as well when I go into the later stages of building the ship. I still need to install a lot of anti-aircraft guns so there will be more super glue marks that get applied I'm not too worried about what I've missed at the moment, but uh, at least for now, the ship is going to look all nicely matted down, and most of the rating will have had its superglue properly concealed. And with that, we come to the end of the video, and at this stage, I am now very happy with how the ship is looking. With the removal of that ugly frosting, I think the paintwork is looking really good. And this rating, it always does help one of these ships along so much. The effect that installing rating has on a 1 in 350 scale ship is always so remarkable. If you are new to photo etch and you don't really want to put on a lot, I would still recommend at least going for hand railings. It helps the ship look a lot more complete and realistic. And with that, it will end with some footage of the ship in its current state. I hope you enjoyed this long form video. If you particularly liked it or particularly disliked it, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Cheers.